Thanks. And uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's, uh, yeah, really good pleasure. I, it's a bit late here for a coffee. I'm, I'm just down here somewhere in Perth, uh, where I've been very quietly um, staying for the whole last year or so. Um, the year before that, I, I did the, the maths and it was equivalent of going 12 times around the equator. That's how much travel I did in one year. Uh, and then from that to zero. So, and I'm loving it. Like, I don't think I'm going back to a lot of travel again. This is, this is, this is it. Uh, it's a bit late here for a coffee. Uh, it, probably good for you there in the, in the UK and Ireland, but I've got a, a, you know, it doesn't really show up. Wow. Look at that. It's actually an orange um, mango lassie that I'm having. So just pretend it's a, um, a Moodle drink. Uh, look, I have a ton of stuff. And the, the, the problem with what I do, uh, which is um, the um, running the Moodle organization uh, at, at the middle of the Moodle project and, and the community, uh, is that there's so many things I could talk about. I end up, you know, the, the, when, I, when I have a keynote, I try and anticipate questions because if I don't, if I do a talk maybe about the importance of public education, which I'd love to do, um, or maybe a talk on um, why you should never eat fish again, which I'd love to do. Um, we, you know, it would be fun, but then everyone's going to ask me all the questions that I'm about to actually cover now. So what I'm going to do is I will give you the laundry list. I'm going to go through all of the updates and all the areas and all the things we've been working on, because I know that's going to answer a lot of questions up front. But I'm going to do it fast and I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end, hopefully 15 minutes or so, so we can really get into questions uh, and then you can eke out all of the areas I didn't cover and uh, we can make this uh, productive hour together. Um, and I really want to hear you, you, uh, w w you know, where you're at right now. Um, a lot of you are Moodle users for a long time. We we've gotten together at this particular conference, the UK and Ireland conference, I apologise before I left our Ireland. I always do that. Um, I don't mean to. It's just um, uh, it's just something in my head. Uh, it's, you know, it's very difficult for us outsiders to get our heads around all this UK and Great Britain and uh, the Ireland's. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And oops, you're going to have to give me screen sharing ability, somebody. Yeah, on it now. You should be able to now, Martin. Yeah, all right, great. Um, let's pop that out. All right. Um, is that the right hashtag, Holly? Mooty UK21? I think it is. That's the right one, yep. Excellent. Certainly I'm is, yeah. I'm not sure if you're using it the other way around or not. Pluggers. Okay. <laughs> That's your hashtag, everybody, as well. Another reminder. Um, Look, so it's been a it's been a year. I don't need to tell, no need to go on about it. Um, uh, so many talks I've seen lately, they really, you know. So we had a pandemic. Yes, we all know we had a pandemic, but I feel like under that there was a ton of other stuff going on that we that's been, um, you know, filling the news. Uh, lots of, uh, you know, fake news. Um, the rise of this sort of chaotic situation where we don't really always know where to get the the news from we're not always sure what's really happening a lot of agendas are being exposed a lot of you know deregulations are happening to help corporate interests um, there's been human rights under the pump from all angles uh, we've got, still got a climate crisis going on let's not forget uh, we've got political upheaval um, you know in the, the US in particular you know as soon as they, they got Trump out I just found my entire life calmed down a lot because it's just all that that stuff that was spewing over the internet from that whole thing. It's still kind of there, but at least it's, you know it's back to normal levels. Um, but you know, elsewhere uh, there are all kinds of political situations here. Australia's quite uh, getting a, you know let's say part of the uh, standing up to China thing that's going on, and there's you know all kinds of um, um, you know, war talk and stuff like that happening. And, and China saying they want to uh, completely build their own set of technologies from the ground up, uh, a completely separate stack of technologies uh, that they run and own 
in the next five years. That's their technology plan. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of pretty big news. Um, we've, we've had recessions. We've had uh, uh, terrible things. In India right now, it's still very, very current. Um, that's going to be a huge problem for the world. And, you know, share markets somehow up and down, uh, certain markets are doing very well, some doing very badly. Um, and look at like the cryptocurrencies right now, like that's just a, a, a huge, you know, I think Dogecoin did, did, went like 800% in recent times, you know, and it's not even a thing, it's just a meme. Um, billions of dollars circulating the planet. And I'm experiencing it personally, actually, where there's a lot of people who are, uh, their money used to be in other industries and they, they didn't do very well. So they're all like, oh, well, what can we put it in? Um, online education seems topical. And, you know, they're approaching uh, us. The whole education sector has been having a lot of investment and, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, acquisitions and strange things happening. So, yeah. Uh, and, of course, there's been an education crisis. And... Very particularly, you look here, about a year ago, uh, on the 1st of April last year, there were uh, nearly 92% of all learners were out of school. These are UNESCO figures. Uh, even just recently, uh, that is now 10%. But still, 10% of the world's learners are still out of school completely. And, uh, and here are the sort of most affected areas. And this has been quite a, a dent to us as a species that, uh, you know, our entire education system has, has had a, a, you know, a punch in the guts here. Um, and we've been part of some of the, the, the talk about solutions here. Uh, there's been a global education coalition from UNESCO. Uh, we are a member. And we've been involved in some discussions and high-level stuff, ministerial level mostly, um, where they've been trying to solve for particular countries. And uh, there's a lot of partners now. We were one of the early ones. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's been a kind of a trend that, and we've been seeing it very directly, that the people are going just into video. And here we are doing a Zoom video at this very moment. Um, I, we, we all know if you're a Moodle user uh, or an ed education technology user that there is a lot more out there. There's a lot of possibilities. For the last 20 years, we've been working at how to build rich uh, collaborative experiences, how to, how to build educational uh, situations that are equal and probably better than uh, turning up face-to-face -face in a class. But when there was suddenly um, the need for everyone to stay home, everyone's jumping to video. And then they work backwards from there. They're like, oh, now I need to manage everything. And they're, they're starting to build around that. And it's, you know, sort of approaching back to where I think Moodle and a lot of the ed tech world was for some years. Um, I'm sure you've all sort of experienced some aspects of that where, you know, the world gets reinvented suddenly and then you go, well, yeah, that's that's old news. Uh, so here's some recent stats of Moodle use. Like a year ago, the registered sites was at 100,000. So we doubled in registered sites nearly um, in a year, uh, which is pretty incredible. So the Moodle's growing very, very fast and continues to. Um, so uh, any reports of, of Moodle's demise are, are uh, exaggerated, as the quote goes. Um, and uh, Spain overtook the US recently, although US continues to climb as well, but Spain is climbing faster, and Spain is the biggest Moodle country in the world by quite a long shot. Um, I'm not seeing the UK and Ireland down here. I'm sure the numbers are smaller, but the quality is exceptional. Um, and, yeah, look, we still are very, very uh, much a part of educational systems uh, around the world. I mean, continue having all, all the discussions that come out of that. Look, I really want to take a little step back because I'm assuming a lot of you know Moodle very well. Um, some of you might not. And I'm just going to very explain a very core thing about Moodle that I'm not sure everybody gets because if you've come into EdTech recently, you might look at Moodle with a different 
point of view, i.e. as a kind of a, a piece of ed tech that's like all of the other ed tech around. But it, it really isn't. Um, it's designed as a flexible toolbox. And that's an important thing to, to say that you then build your own education platform. So there's not to every Moodle site looks and, and functions differently or has the ability to and in quite extreme ways. So that's why it's used in all sorts of education sectors in, in all different education systems. So you can really build it the way you want to. But at its heart, there is this structure, which is that in a particular site, you have course categories. Um, I need a pointer here. You can see my arrow, I guess. Um, you have course categories, which could be a department or a particular subject area. And then within that, you have courses. And that's the basic high-level structure. And then you have an administration thing, which lets you connect all of those things, all those courses to um, integrations that are out there uh, or to change the whole look and feel. And there's like a ton of configuration and settings. Uh, a lot of statistics, importing, exporting, and security. Um, that's the basic overall structure here. And so far, not so amazing. But when you get into the individual courses, each course is meant to be a sequence of activities and resources mixed together. And the more activities, the better, because activities are where you get students producing grades uh, or some output. Um, you get them doing things. And these all are collected into one grade book into central places where you can see all of the results in one place. And you, your job is to build up an experience for students uh, doing things and reading things or, or re, you know, looking at resources, uh, videos or you know, consuming things. Um, and they're meant to be very mixed. Um, a lot of online courses, though, are not like that. A lot of online courses are, here's a ton of stuff to consume, and then we're going to test you on it. And that isn't good design. So uh, what I wanted to say was that, that you should be thinking of learning, and this applies to anybody in the education space, actually, is that to remember that you learn best while you're constructing a representation of your learning for others. So most YouTube teachers are actually themselves learning they are there pushing themselves by making a video or whatever it is instagram or feeds you know um, and it's the same in moodle if you're pushing yourself to create representations of your learning that's the one thing that's just really going to lock that in there you're going to your own learning is going to be super powered um, so you're what you need to do and why sometimes making courses can be exciting because you're forced to do that you need to get your students doing that and you need to get your students on their own learning journeys where they're completely making a feed for the students around them. So let's get to these, the, the grab bag of product news. Um, pretty sure I'm getting some quite slow updating going on here on the slides. I'm not sure why. Um, I'll persevere. So let's, let's first look at... Uh, uh, we're going to look at the tools that we make, then we're going to look at the resources uh, that we have available, and then we're just the skills area and what, what's changing in all these things. Um, wow, it's very strange things going on with my browser. Let's see how it goes. So uh, you know for Moodle 4 that we have Moodle 4.0 coming up, a very, very big release, uh, a lot of attention being paid to... Um, Hang on a second, I'm just going to try and reduce this window a little bit and see if that helps. Oh, let's do that for a while. Uh, and I'll jump back to here. So we have Moodle 4.0 coming up, a huge release. Uh, we're spending, we've been spending a couple of years on it. Uh, we intend to be done by the end of the year-ish. Um, and the two minor releases, or well, major releases that we're calling minor, are, are really focused on like community fixes and smaller projects. So we put out 3.10 recently. Um, 
3.10 in November, uh, a few things. You can download course content. There were some improvements, payment gateway, LTI improvements. You know, if you use these things, hopefully they're really useful for you. Um, and But a lot of them came from, uh, there were smaller things to us. And then in 3.11, coming out, I think, next week, uh, there's some big features, uh, student activity completion, which was something from the Moodle Users Association. Um, and so that means inside courses now, you can get a better view as a student about what you need to do and how to get there. Uh, we're adding the Brickfield Accessibility Tools. Um, talk about those later. Uh, we've got Open Badges 2.1 support. We really want to keep up our standards and there's tons of other little improvements as, as usual. But Really, most of our attention is on 4.0, and there's a lot of prototyping going on. There is a lot of doing and also redoing things. So sometimes it might look like when you look at UX work that there's not a lot of change or, you know, you guys, well, you probably think, oh, I could have done that in two weeks. Well, but to get to those simple things, you have to go round and round and do a lot of trials and take a lot of wrong turns, and that's just the nature of, of design. We're trying to make all the mistakes at once so that 4.0 is really something um, amazing. And uh, uh, here's one thing you'll notice is that the courses, my courses, has been separated out from the dashboard, and there's now these standard menus at the top. Um, that's likely to, can, to be in the release. Um, so there's a dedicated My Courses page. And once you go into courses, you'll see some things like here on the left, a new what we call course index that shows you all of the sections and the activities and resources in the course in a nice little overview. Um, so no matter what the course format is and how the rest of it is laid out, you'll have that always available on the side. And you see the edit mode button on the top right here that says for a teacher to turn things on and off, turn editing on and off, make that very clear. And um, the, the other thing to point out is this uh, navigation, second level navigation in the course is appearing here as a kind of a uh, tabbed um, menu. And that goes right down into activities and things as well. And that's testing very well uh, with users. It's much easier to see you know, what are the things at this level that, that are uh, settings or, or, or um, you know, menus. Uh, a lot of focus on the mobile experience as well. So these are some uh, prototypes of the, the mobile view. So it's the web version of Moodle in a mobile browser. Uh, and our goal is to make it uh, feel very familiar to the desktop version, but be very specifically mobile. Um, and our mobile app will converge with this as well. So if you want to get involved, uh, Moodle.org UX is the place to go. And you'll have, um, there's forums there. Uh, we've just changed some responsibilities in the UX team recently. And you'll see an ad has just gone up for a new, uh, some new very senior UX people. Uh, we're really building up the team and we want, um, so if you, if you have someone who's strong on UX uh, in Moodle particularly, uh, uh, let us know because we are hiring at the moment in that area. Uh, a lot of work still to do. Uh, our Moodle plugins continue to grow. That's actually more like nearly 2,000 plugins, so many people making additions. Um, and uh, the most latest uh, certified integration we added um, was Poodle, which was sitting in that uh, plugin repository for a long time, very widely used for language learning, uh, and has become a... Um, uh, certified integration recently. So we do recommend that for language learning if you want to, if you're doing that. Uh, and something that we have had on the plans for a while and is slated to start development uh, later this year is this Moodle plugin service. Um, I've, we've been doing a lot of road mapping lately. We'll be publishing it uh, shortly, but um, this is on it. Um, and what this is, and this is a terrible diagram, I apologize, but what this is showing you is a bit of an idea of how the plugin service works. So those nearly 2,000 plugins in the plugins database, um, the, particularly we're starting with activity plugins, you as a developer can opt in to say, yes, I want to opt into this service, and you will get a server on the system to host lots and lots of instances of your plugin in, in the cloud. 
and the experience for teachers is that a teacher can say, oh, I would love one of those instances in my course. And without having to install any code, they get one and it appears in their course using the magic of LTI. And that way uh, we have a kind of app store that um, you, it's a service, so we'll be charging subscriptions for it. We'll keep them as reasonable as we can to pay for the service, but also importantly, to pay the developers because we want developers to have a revenue source. We want re developers to work hard at making their plugins better and popular because then we get better software, all of us, and developers get paid. Um, and that's a bit of a problem with our plugins right now is that, um, you know, it's wonderful in open source that anybody can write stuff and share it, but we all need to think about maintenance and uh, sustainability. So this eventually will be like our app store, but we're calling it the Moodle plugins service. So uh, if you uh, lo love to hear from anyone who's interested in, in helping with that, um, but we, we plan to start it later in the year. Uh, Moodle Workplace has been going great guns for us, huge developments happening there. Um, and one of the coolest things that's happening um, at the moment is uh, just the, the growth. Our, our partners have been um, using Workplace to, and, and Workplace is a version of Moodle with some extra features, particularly for workplace learning, um, like onboarding and automations and programs and uh, uh, 360s and compliance and those sorts of things. Um, and a lot of partners are taking that and working with large customers, some quite large customers. And, and one of the largest is the US Air Force at the moment, um, uh, which is, you know, getting up towards nearly a million users. And that's a, a incredible um, to work, an incredible organization to work with. Um, I, I'm very happy that, that uh, US Defense Force money is going towards open source, right? Let me put that. So um, I, I think that's a good thing that that money can be going towards. Um, so we're, uh, that, that's, uh, workplace is really proving itself and um, proving quite useful. And workplace is only available through our service providers, through partners, and, and that's part of the sustainability of Moodle. Um, but we have committed to putting a feature from Moodle Workplace into Moodle LMS on every release. And the big one that's going to be landing in Moodle 4.0 is the report builder, um, which is a new graphical way to make reports and uh, quite exciting stuff. Great work from the team on the Workplace team. And it's, I'm looking forward to that hitting LMS soon. Uh, and the last few releases all, all had something as well. So yeah, Workplace really helps to drive the development of LMS and helps pay for the developers to work on LMS as well. Uh, our apps, uh, about a year ago, we introduced these new plans. We, we tried not to affect most people. With the, the free plan is perfectly fine for most users, but if you want a bit extra, um, you can pay a bit extra. And these are some prices for an organization level. And again, that helps Moodle. Um, survive and grow. Um, so let me talk about the resources here. Um, now we have a ton of Moodle partners, over a hundred. Uh, these are the ones in the UK and Ireland. Um, very familiar to most people here. I think um, some of these companies have been supporting Moodle through their uh, paying royalties on their revenue uh, for many years, uh, you know, 10, 15 years in some cases. And uh, these are the folks who are driving most of the sustainability of Moodle. These are the companies who are pushing the boundaries and they're really uh, where the experts gravitate uh, to be, you know, to help make great solutions out of Moodle, um, which can be very specific. As I said, Moodle is a LMS builder, right? Um, and that work um, is what our partners are, are best at. Um, so we love our partners and we're very supportive of a, the, net, the worldwide network of them. Um, we had some very particular news just recently, and you might have missed it, uh, but um, we announced that what we're doing is something very new. Uh, Moodle is acquiring three of our Moodle partners in the US. Um, and we're working together, the four of us, the four companies, 
to build a Moodle US service. And that's very specific for the US um, that we need to do that and to find that sort of solution to scale to a size to support those sort of clients um, and to be able to compete um, in that very uh, busy e-learning market where you know, most uh, of the uh, competitors to Moodle are based there and, and work a lot there. Um, we needed to be Moodle there in the US. And so that's an exciting thing. We've been working really hard with these folks. Uh, everyone in these companies, a lot of them have been with Moodle for 15 years and they're old friends. So it's a bit like getting the band together um, and crafting a solution that's best for this part of the world. Um, and that will be working together with our partners globally um, to, to do the same sorts of things uh, all around the world. Um, well, to support our partners to do that, right? And uh, yeah, so that's a, a really good thing for Moodle as well. Uh, a little news about Moodle Cloud. Uh, we've got uh, a bit of news. We've got a new large plan uh, since last November, uh, which has been popular. Um, we've been cleaning up the plans on Moodle Cloud, uh, getting rid of Moodle for schools and just making it Moodle uh, and uh, those sort of tidy ups. Uh, there's a ton of things happening under the hood because there are, you know, many tens of thousands of Moodle sites on this thing. Uh, and the infrastructure has been upgraded a lot in the last year and really bringing huge performance improvements to Moodle Cloud. And we really want those Moodle sites to be, you know, zippy fast. Uh, we have a new UX person dedicated in that team and you'll start seeing changes in the UI. Uh, there's a new sign-up process, very simplified, uh, landing this week, next few days. Uh, the customer portal is changing and there's a new survey going out to Moodle Cloud users. So if you have a Moodle Cloud site, we'd love your feedback, uh, what's working for you, what isn't, and, uh, and help the team drive that forward. And one of the things we're thinking about is that before we get to Moodle 4.0, that we'll have 4.0 beta sites on there. So if you just want a site to play with the new 4.0 and try it out, that you can get one really easily from Moodle Cloud. So yeah, look forward to that. Uh, Moodle Net. Um, we have uh, a lot of uh, development that's been happening over the years on MoodleNet. This is really the, the third or fourth iteration of MoodleNet. Um, but we have a new team now and a new approach to MoodleNet. Uh, we, we used to be very focused on activity, um, activity stream as a, as a standard. Um, that turned out not to be such a great technical decision. Um, we've actually started building again about six months ago. Uh, we expect to have a release out of MoodleNet in a couple of months. The, we've simplified um, a lot of the, the, the proposition of MoodleNet, um, and I think it's going to be, it's going to really work well. We, we hope that every Moodle user, every organizational user, uh, might want to download a MoodleNet and get it going locally. If you, if you, if you feel like you have a lot of content you want to you give, so we're hoping there's a lot of people who, who take part in this, this experiment, but we're, we're building a, a network of content and something Moodle hasn't really had properly before. Uh, we think what we have here is the right way. And after a couple of prototypes and different trials at it, we're getting better and better at knowing what we have to build. So uh, happy to take questions on that later if you like. And uh, I, I have a demo I could show, but I'm not going to right now. Uh, we have, uh, I, I mentioned before, our certified integrations and the latest one, uh, uh, Poodle. Um, we have a new one joining us soon, and that is uh, Brickfield. Uh, so Gavin and, and Karen at Brickfield, you'll probably be hearing a bit about it during the conference. Uh, it's an accessibility checking toolkit. So it's, there's something included in in Moodle 3.11, and it'll be a new standard feature going forward uh, that analyzes course content and helps you fix common accessibility errors. Because it's no point Moodle itself being um, certified for accessibility if you if if teachers go and just put content in it that isn't. Um, so we we've been working together on this for some time uh, to 
to get the right balance of you know what's a good um, startup package here what's the what's the features that should be in core and be for free for everybody uh, and if you need more advanced stuff uh, that a lot of it will require server resources and so brickfield are providing those uh, as subscriptions and um, highly recommended to be a new certified integrations just launching basically now-ish uh, so that's one of our development partners and there's a bunch of other stuff we can talk about later let me get on to the last thing on my list here which is moodle academy um, for a while we've had an education team and you would have seen uh, learn moodle our mooc that runs twice a year um, mary cooch and helen foster both uh, staples of the Moodle community um, teach these courses and um, have been doing so for some years and they usually always get 3,000 plus people. Um, we have a couple of self-paced courses now on admin basics and plugin development basics and these teaching basics, oh sorry, teaching next level. Uh, and at the same time we've had this MEC which is a, a high level certification um, that focuses on 22 competencies, which are these uh, European standard. And that's going really well. We have uh, 28 Moodle partners uh, certified to run the MEC. So we've done the training and the certification for them. And then they now will, can take anyone who wants to through the MEC, which is a, it's a process. It's a real certification and it covers a lot of really deep stuff it's not just how to use moodle this is how to be a great online educator um, uh, we will also there's also a direct plan if you have a large organization a lot of people to train come and talk to us we can offer you something and we we have this translated into 10 languages and that's been going really well and growing exponentially since we launched it uh, uh, properly last year um, there's an example of the translation. We actually built a translation tool, a Moodle plugin that helps you do this translation in the content. Uh, it's not using those HTML tags, um, the, the old multi-lang method. It's a way of doing it with this plugin that's uh, quite a lot more efficient. And you have an interface inside Moodle to do the translation. Uh, that is on the plugins database if you want it. So go and have a look there for translation. Uh, so what we're doing is, I mentioned we have all these courses, we have the MEC, and it was time to start thinking about how do we bring all this together and have a whole learning plan, a whole curriculum from start to finish so that this is how you become a great online teacher and then eventually you get an MEC that proves it. Um, so we are building that and the name will be Moodle Academy. Um, some of you old timers may remember we used this name before for a MOOC platform. That is not what this is. This is an online institution. And we really want to push Moodle to its limits. We want to show what a well-designed Moodle site can really do. Uh, we want it to be possible for you to, to learn everything you need to know about internet-based education from an educator perspective as a teacher, but also later on, uh, administration and designers, so like instructional design, how do you design content uh, for online use, um, and even developers. In fact, developers is the second one we're going to do because there is such a need for certifi certification of Moodle developers in the world. Uh, there's a lot of demand for this, so this will be our second one. But first, we're focusing on the teachers and that educator path. Uh, as well, on that platform, you'll start seeing we'll have global live events. Now, we're not running any Moodle Moots ourself, ourselves as Moodle HQ this year. Uh, we decided not to. Instead, we're putting the effort and resources into this because this will be like a kind of Moodle Moot that runs every day and is always there. So we're, there will be live, actual live events, but they'll be short, like webinars, and they'll be often and they'll be localized in different languages. And uh, there'll be ways for us to connect globally um, all through the year. So 
that's uh, the the main plan with Academy. Uh, we recently hired the uh, manager for Moodle Academy, which is uh, somebody called Jessica Gramp. And I think a lot of you might know Jessica because she's been at Moots for years. Uh, so Jessica and Mary and uh, and Helen and, and Anna and uh, others are uh, part of the team building this out. So um, quite an exciting project. Lastly, I just want to get into a bit about the, the future of EdTech. So if you look at Moodle, uh, you know, objectively, we have a nearly 20-year-old PHP application. <laughs> uh, it's a monolithic application for those developers out, out there. Uh, if I was starting Moodle again right now, I wouldn't build it that way. And I don't think anyone else would either. Uh, that's not how, you know, computer science has come a long way in 20 years. Uh, the PHP application is surprisingly useful and long lived, and I'm sure we're going to be building on it and using it for many years to come. But it's not the future in, say, 10 years, um, and maybe not even seven years. It's, we need to think about what is the future? What is the learning platform? Do we want to just let Google design that? Do we want to let Apple design that? Um, I would argue no. I think openness is an important value of the Moodle project, one of our most important values. Um, and not only that, openness is a critical thing for education. Uh, the, in the content area, UNESCO has agreed, so the world's countries have unanimously agreed that content should be open. And everyone's working towards that now. Um, we don't really need publishers anymore to uh, intermediate and put huge markups and lock up our content. We can quite happily share content on the internet. And, and in that sense, you know, open um, educational resources or OERs are definitely where we're heading in that space. But in the infrastructure space, in the technology space, look at the very internet itself. The internet itself is very open. If you want to start an ISP, go ahead, right? Connect up and off you go. If you want to uh, run a survey yourself, you, know, you can get a Raspberry Pi and just connect it up. You can. Uh, and, and the internet is this giant shared consensus of standards that lets everybody connect to it and hook it up. And, and through the magic of this giant pile of wires, uh, here we are. And I'm talking now, sitting in my room in, in Perth, and you're, you're getting me loud and clear, uh, either live or maybe you're watching this later. But that entity is like a, a giant uh, pile of, um, I don't know if you know about fungus, right? Mushroom funguses that grow under the ground. The whole world is completely encircled with this stuff. Uh, we don't think about it very often. Um, but what we have built is something like that on the surface. We've built this entire network that joins us together and no one owns it. You know, people own bits of it, but no one owns the whole thing. And that's, that's the critical thing. That's the openness. So on top of that, you have uh, software running on top of, well, you have hardware as well. And, you know, hardware is also relatively open. You can build servers, you can make machines, you can build your own. Um, a lot of everything's made out of components right and then on top of that now we have linux all of those billion dollar unicorn companies are completely reliant on linux you wouldn't have twitter without or google or apple or amazon or microsoft without linux and unix and that open source servers that are running there like you just wouldn't um and on a higher level, we have, you know, all these other software packages and Moodle being one of them. So if we're now looking at the future, uh, and, and I like to think of, a, of an e-learning future in such that every device that I have, every device that's connected to the internet will automatically have some easy uh, way to get to learn to to learn particular things and uh, be certified in those things, and yes, we're building that in many 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 websites around the world, Moodle included. Uh, but 
a lot of your data is locked up in particular places. Um, you, I don't think we all want to store our learning records on LinkedIn. Um, we don't want to all store them anywhere, really. We want to own our own learning records. And when we show them to somebody, they should believe us. It should be trustworthy. So there's a lot of uh, work around the, uh, talking about open skills. How do we, how do we build a, a, a global network to recognize skills? Um, you know, blockchain is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. Um, and then, uh, you know, what these skills mean, mean different things to different communities. A lot of us in the world, are, you know, skills are very localized in many ways. So how do we get communities around these things? How do we empower communities to be part of the education system? Uh, it can't all be driven by a national government and UNESCO are not stepping up to do it either. It's kind of a community thing. And you see these communities all over the internet right now where there are recognition of very particular skills. Um, you know, if you look into, we're all YouTube users, right? And you look in there and you start following your interests and you start discovering, you know, key people who stand out, these kind of gurus of the area. And they have communities they're building around them. And I, I really want to see us use the power of community to drive our education a bit more uh, explicitly, a bit more intentionally, um, so that we can all move forward together. We're all learning together. And if we want to fix the problems that are going on on this ball here, uh, we need to all work together. So how do we get ourselves around those key problems like the sustainable development goals of the UN? How do we really bring it together. So I feel like the learning platform has got to be hooked up to that, right? You, you, if you're slightly interested in, in the ecosystems of the world, how do you get in touch with the people who are leading the charge on that? Uh, and how do you all help each other, as an example, or, or engineering, or, or nursing, or, or whatever it is? Uh, we also have lots of new devices coming down the pike, and uh, I've been playing with VR for 20, 30 years, uh, watching it slowly, slowly getting closer to its promise. Um, and, you know, the big companies, sorry, the big companies are, are working on it. Um, there's improvements all the time. But at some point, it'll just be part of our reality that the digital world will be overlaid on top of the actual world. And then the way that's overlaid is just going to get better and better and better. And this network we've built is going to be part of our everyday reality. And you can just, you know, you can see it, right? Probably a lot of you already are talking to your phones and talking to your uh, various speakers that you've in installed around the house and, and all of that. Um, we, how do we build all that stuff in a really open way? And how do we build all that so it's connected to your learning and helps you with your learning? Um, uh, keep flicking the screen. Um, so that's just about your, your connection to the world, right? We want to connect people in a healthy way to the world uh, so that we are working towards common goals. Uh, you know, I like to, I like uh, sci-fi that shows kind of a post chaotic human world where we've got past all of this chaos um, that we're having here and we get to somewhere approaching a fairly peaceful place where you know we're going to get to about 10 and a half billion people and then it's actually going to stabilize so this 10 and a half billion people it's going to be putting a lot of pressure on our environment we better solve all the issues and and get to some sort of a, a healthy balance so um i think education is core to this and the education tools we build are, are core to this uh you know Elon Musk has got a company called Neuralink, which is literally putting wires in your brain. And, you know, the computers will be, your brain will be connected 24 hours a day to the internet if you choose. Um, but you don't even need your brain to be physically connected. Literally, the way we use our devices and with the incredible amounts of surveillance and data processing we have, we're, we're already there, right? Your every, your every move is predicted um, by AI. Uh, and I've been spending a lot of time with the GPT work lately from OpenAI, and that's a, um, it's a general purpose algorithm 
and it's absorbed, processed uh, billions of human-made documents from the internet and is now so powerful as a general purpose intelligence that it can you can have a chat with it and you will not know it isn't a human. Like it, it's actually passed the Turing test. I don't know if it's formally been declared as such, but I have a chatbot version of it and, you know, it blows me away every time. It's, it's very, very, uh, very human-like the way it can respond and ask you questions and be part of a conversation. Uh, secondly, that same AI can design a website for you. You can say, I want a website that has these features. Give it to me and it will go array and write HTML. It'll write CSS. It'll write PHP. It'll write languages because it, it doesn't really care uh, whether it's English or some other language. It just does whatever it takes. Um, it's real science fiction stuff and it exists. It's right in our world today. You could tell this thing to go away and write Wikipedia again and it would. And it would look plausible. The thing is, it wouldn't be 100% accurate because no one's fact-checked any of it. It'll just be making up facts left, right, and centre. <laughs> it'll look plausible, but it'll be fake news. Um, so given that these AIs are going to become a reality in terms of every bit of knowledge work any of us are doing, if you're working in any area where you're creating stuff or, or processing information, uh, you're going to have an AI sidekick. And that AI sidekick you know, there'll be hundreds of AI sidekicks, but you're going to have assisted everything, uh, assisted creation, assisted design, assisted communication, assisted teaching, assisted learning. Everything will be assisted. Microsoft went and bought the rights to GPT-3 because they want to do exactly that. They're going to start building into all the Microsoft products. Um, it was pretty upsetting, actually, that a company like that was able to buy this thing that was actually called OpenAI originally, um, but they they managed to. At least OpenAI are using the money from that to build a lot of other new stuff. So hopefully it does stay open and becomes open and, and more um, widely used. But these are all the things. So, look, I've got here in the middle Moodle Next Generation. Um, that's more of an inspirational thing than an actual... Um, product as such what does a Moodle next generation look like in this environment um, imagine the first time you flip on your TV or your VR glasses that there's an app already installed and that helps you get in touch with your learning what does that app look like uh, and that's I think the challenge for the Moodle community to start getting into so we We'll be leading a kind of research effort. I want to put together a team of, of the best researchers we can find around the world who are interested in this to start actually diving in deeper into these issues and designing what that should look like um, in the second half of this year. So you'll start seeing stuff like that around the Moodle community and uh, I'd love it if you, you helped us join in with that. Look, that's, that's me. I got 10 minutes left, I think, for some questions. So I'm um, very happy to do that. Uh, you can touch, you can get in touch with me here on, uh, on Twitter or most platforms actually using Moodle, even Telegram and uh, email as well. Thanks very much for listening.